All right, I got the thumbs up from the guys in the booth, so I think that means that I can get started. A uh, little pitch behind the scenes, when you're a presenter at a Cisco Live or an event like this, the most difficult, awkward portion of the session are those three minutes where we're standing up here waiting for the clock to hit the time, and you're looking at me, and I'm looking at you, and I'm looking at you. And it just keeps going from there. But we have arrived at 1.30. And we are back here in the Cisco U Theater at Cisco Live EMEA in Amsterdam. Thank you all for joining me here in our booth. And thank you to everybody who's watching online from the stream. We want to bring you a lot of great topics here at the Cisco U Theater. And if, is it, who's been to a Cisco U session so far this week? A few? Yeah, we've got a wide variety of some of the latest and greatest innovations from Cisco. We're talking cloud security. We're talking cloud over here. We're talking automation. We're all these SD-WAN, all of these fantastic new innovations. And you all came to hear me talk about TACX. Yeah. I like it. Because I knew when I was talking with our team and we're saying, okay, we're going to do sessions in the booth. We wanted to do all of the latest and greatest, tell you about what we're innovating on. But I'm a real network engineer. Who else is a real network engineer, right? It's not just the new stuff that we have to deal with. We have to deal with stuff like TACX and rollback, or uh, uh, role-based access control. And yes, we still have to deal with spanning tree. I don't care what else comes through. We're always going to have to deal with these topics. And so you'll be sure to get all of that type of content from us in the Cisco U Theater, as well as learning and certification forever. Slight shameless self-promotion. We've got a lot of great things going on at Cisco Live. We've got innovations. We've got Cisco U that we're talking about. We've got Cisco Modeling Labs, one of my favorite products that Cisco has, particularly from learning and certification. Some of our developers are back there giving demos and updates on some of the latest features. And if you're interested, but you haven't quite pulled the trigger on CML, we have a great deal. I think it's... Uh, I'm, I'm afraid to say the percentage, 25. All right, I got, I, I blanked on what the number was, but 25% off Cisco Modeling Labs Personal or Personal Plus available for anybody. Just go to the Cisco Learning Network store and it's already on sale. No code needed, no anything. So take advantage of that if you get a chance. All right, all the advertising and marketing is out of the way. Let's get into the good stuff. And the good stuff today is all about security, device-based security. So what exactly is AAA and RBAC, right? One of my favorite people to talk to about networking, to learn about networking, is my good buddy, Carl, the network engineer. And so we see here Carl explaining exactly what AAA is all about as he is trying to do something to his network. He sits down and he logs in and he says, hello, network, I would like to make this change. And the network replies, uh, who are you? And he says, come on, I'm Carl, you know who I am. And it's like, oh, that's right, hope everything's going well. And so Carl comes back and he says, cool, can I, so can I make this change? And the network's feeling a bit snarky and it's like, I don't know, can you? And he says, come on, check my credentials, check my rights. And the network goes back and says, yeah, yeah, everything seems in order. Like, I think we're in good shape. And so finally Carl sits down and he's like, all right, can I make the network change? And the network's like, sure but I'm making a note. I remember that you did that. In fact, the network is always watching. This is AAA in a nutshell. Our first two panels are all about the first day, authentication, making sure that the network or whatever the device is knows who you are. Once we know who you are, then we get into our second A, authorization. What are you allowed to do? All right, so that's our second A. The third A is accounting, keeping track of what you did once you were connected to the network. Triple A, there are three separate steps. So we remember authentication, just who you are. At that point, we don't care what you can do. We just wanna make sure we know that's who you are. Authorization, what are you allowed to do once you're connected to the network? And then accounting, keeping track of what's out there. I always start out by defining those because it's really easy, particularly to combine those first two A's together. Right? We think once we know who you are, certainly we know what you can do. And sure, even in practice, they often are kind of merged together. They happen very quickly, but they are separate steps. And when you're configuring 
AAA and RBAC and TACX or RADIUS. You have to treat them separately. You have to remember they're handled as two separate steps. And then the accounting only is relevant after we set it up when something goes wrong. Are you trying to figure out who went in there and deleted that VLAN? That's when accounting is really important. It's also why I think some network engineers don't like to set up AAA because it's so much easier to blame somebody else if we all just log in as admin. All right, you're not being recorded, so it's okay. Feel free to answer this honestly, but who still logs into their production network as admin? Anybody? Nobody's willing to admit, all right. I know there's somebody out there that hasn't set it up and you came here today to learn how to actually set up RBAC. So I've said R back a few times. The R stands for role. What is a role? A role is a way that we can group together users of a similar type. And so different organizations might have different roles, but some common ones would be your network administrators, the people that are allowed to pretty much do whatever they want. Then we have our network operators, the folks that maybe just get read-only access or limited configuration and operations access. And then these days with automation, we're starting to see a new role be defined. And I firmly believe that it should be a dedicated role, right? Automation systems, the things that are gonna come in and touch our network, but maybe is, is not a person, right? We wanna treat them slightly differently. Once we have our roles, then we can assign the rights and privileges. It is far easier to maintain if we assign privileges to roles and not to people. Right? I don't want to go through and say every time we add or remove someone from our team, go in and give them rights. We give them to the roles that are there. And the reality is every single um, network device and platform is going to define roles separately and locally. And so when we set up RBAC, AAA, what we have to do is we have to provide details back to the device that indicate what this person's role should be in the, the terminology, the framework with that, that that platform understands. And we're gonna talk specifically and compare kind of how like the Nexus platform does that versus a traditional iOS platform. And so we'll see because every device kind of handles roles locally on their own and we're just simply passing down the advice to it. Most organizations in production, our goal is to find a way to map back to an LDAP often Active Directory, but typically just any LDAP server. And so the user logs in, we verify them with that LDAP, that centralized identification system, and we map it into a role. That's generally what we're trying to do. Now this is the learning and certifications booth, and so we don't just pick willy-nilly topics to talk about. Sometimes we do, but I always like to sit back and say, okay, how, is, how does this relate to my career certifications that are there? And I had a gut feeling when I sat down to put this content together that RBAC and AAA was important in a few certifications. Boy, did I underestimate it. I went through our blueprints one after another after another, and holy cow, does AAA show up all over. From the CCNA 2.8, 5.8, AAA and RBAC and TACX and RADIUS show up. We see it show up in Encore and ENRC. We see it in the security side. We have an entire certification dedicated to ICE that has 7.0, an entire domain focused on device administration. And at the expert level, we don't get away from it either. I've got enterprise infrastructure, wireless security, service provider, data center. AAA skills are back as a core function that we need to do as network engineers, no matter whether we're just getting started or we become experts in our field. And so that's another reason why thank you all for joining me while I talk about probably one of the least interesting topics here, but it is so important. Security is so important. So what is our AAA architecture? Let's go through this kind of one step at a time, one A at a time. Generally, you're gonna have like four components to a AAA architecture. We've got the client, the person, and probably the tool, their laptop or whatever they're logging in from. We've then got our network device, the network device that we're trying to access. We have an authentication server. From Cisco these days, that's typically ICE, but back in the day it was secure ACS, right? We've had different platforms that do this over the time. And then not necessarily absolutely required, but almost everybody I talk to also has an identification server. As mentioned, that can often be Active Directory, Microsoft AD. So these are the four components. And so authentication, what do we do? 
we sit down as the client, we sit down at our system and we attempt to log into a server, log into a client. The network device doesn't know how to verify that I'm me. And so it passes it off to the authentication server and says, hey, can you verify that this is actually Hank? The authentication server looks in and says, okay, well, I don't have user lists. I need to go ask the identification server, is this Hank, right? The identification server comes back and says, yep, that indeed is Hank. The authentication server can then go back and say, yeah, yeah, that's Hank. And now we have, tr we have handled the first A, authentication. Once we've done that, then the network device has to go back to the authentication server and say, hey, okay, what is Hank allowed to do? What is his role? The authentication server will go through and say, okay, I, kn I know it's Hank. What do I know about Hank, right? What characteristics does he have? Typically, what groups is he in, right? What security groups is he in? The, the identification server passes all that information back. The authentication server checks it, finds an entry in the RBAC policy set, and then passes back and says, okay, here's what Hank can do. And now we have completed that process, those first two A's, and Hank can now do whatever he's allowed to do. Once Hank gets started, he's gonna go into the accounting phase. I will go in and say, I wanna do something. I'm going to do X. That network device says, okay, well, I need to go ahead and make sure we record that. And it is sent off to the authentication server. Hey, Hank did X. And the authentication server just keeps track of that, remembers that it's in place. So that's what we're trying to set up. Everybody still with me? Excellent. So how do we do that? All right, we're going to talk about how we can enable device administration with this characteristics in mind. We're gonna look at a couple of different network devices, specifically an iOS XE device and a Nexus-based device. I will say almost all the iOSs work the same way. So if you're still on some legacy iOS devices or even XR, they're very similar on that side. Our authentication server will be leveraging Cisco ICE and Microsoft Active Directory. I will be using the TACX protocol for this demonstration. Radius is similar, but there are some unique differences on that side. If I had more than 25 minutes to talk to you all, we could do both, but I've only got 25 minutes. We will be leveraging AAA default policies. Also, if we had more time, we could go into kind of customizing policies on that, but we're gonna stick with the defaults for AAA. And we'll look at two different roles, full read write, our admins, as well as our operator roles. We'll start on the device side, device configuration. When you sit down to configure AAA on a device, there are basically kind of these steps involved. We have to set up the client to server connectivity. In this case, the client is the network device, the switch, the router, whatever device we're talking to. The server is the ICE, right? Your authentication server that's out there. We have to define and group all of these servers together. In a production deployment, I hope you have more than one authentication server because things get a little hinky if your authentication servers are down. And right? it's one of the dangerous elements of working with AAA, right? So ideally, you'll group them together and then you'll set up your fallback authentication account. Do not forget to set up a fallback authentication account. I'm seeing some smiles and nods. Some people have either kind of learned that the hard way or were smart enough to do it first and have to take advantage of it but definitely don't forget to set that up. After that, we have to set up our three A's, our AAA policies, authentication, authorization, and accounting, and they are three separate policies. So our basic setup, it's actually not a lot of configuration we have to do. Up at the top, we see our iOS XE-based devices. AAA services have to be enabled with a really weird command. I don't actually understand the history of it, but it's AAA new model. I always wanna know what was the old model, but we're gonna turn on the new model, right? I'm new and fancy, right? It's the 2024s, we'll do the new model of AAA. Then immediately we set up our fallback account. Um, personal preference, I don't like to use just admin as a fallback account, it's too generic. I always pick something different. I don't vary that far, so our default is often just local admin, kind of right there in the name, it's the local administrator account. In iOS, we handle roles based on privilege levels. So Priv15 indicates an admin user. We can then go ahead and determine how is the client going to talk to the identification servers. It's using TACX as the protocol. And so we're gonna source all of that traffic from some interface on the device. In this case, we're using VLAN 11, 
Maybe it's an out-of-band management port, right? Whatever you're going to go through. If that interface exists in a VRF, don't forget to assign the VRF to that command as well. I have made that mistake at least three times and spent way too long troubleshooting the problem. So I put a note, configure the VRF if you need to. And XOS is a little simpler. Nexus operating system uses a concept of features for the different things that it can do. So we have to remember to turn on feature TAC X plus, and then we can set up our username, local admin, and then our, what our password is. And we can see the role is actually used and defined as network admin. Nexus starts out with a couple of default roles, network admin, network operator, and there it is possible to configure additional roles if you need to. Now here's a step that I put in here is the option, though I highly recommend taking advantage of this at least at the initial stage of setting up AAA. And this is where you configure your console access, your terminal server access, to just use local authentication until you verify that your ICE access is functional. And so to do this on iOS XE, we set up a special authentication and authorization policies called console that just use local. And so then we can use that local admin account. In Nexus, it's super easy. AAA authentication, login, console, local. Um, oh, and then on iOS XE, you have to do kind of specify that you're going to use those groups. Again, this is an option. If you're really, really confident in your AAA setup and your ICE server, by all means, skip it. But when I'm first setting up a new system for this, I always set it this way so that I know I can get into the console when I lock myself out, because I will certainly lock myself out at some point along the way. Moving right along, our next step is to define our uh, group and define and group the TACX servers. iOS and Nexus do this slightly differently. In iOS, we define our TACX server, TACX server ISO 1, what's its IP address, and then what is the secret key. I will tell you that my secret key in my, my actual network is not secure TACX key, and I would recommend you all not using secure TACX key as well. It is a great slide key, though, to remind us that it should be a secure key. You would configure as many TACX servers as you want. So in the slide, I've only defined one, but you can see down here I've grouped like I had two of them in place. Ideally, you have a minimum of two TACX servers out there, Okay, minimum of two. In Nexus, it's a similar but slightly different. TACX server host, what is its key? And then here we group our servers together. The other thing to notice is in Nexus, we actually assign what VRF and interface to use to talk to ICE as part of the grouping command. This allows that if you had different groups of servers, maybe they go out different interfaces. Um, that would be quite the complex out-of-band management network setup, but I've seen worse things done in a network. Once I have my servers defined and grouped, now I can set up my policies. As mentioned, there are three policies, uh, authentication, authorization, and accounting. They have to be set up separately. In iOS XE, authentication and authorization are kind of single line commands. We're gonna do login default, which means unless we override this approach to logging into the device, like we did with console, it is going to use my ICE TACX if that is unavailable, we'll use local. That's that fallback. Don't forget to fall back to local. I've also done that a couple of times, and that's been a headache to fix. From an authorization, very, very similar. Here we're going to authorize exec access to the device using group, ICE, TACX, and local. From an accounting perspective in... Um, from an accounting perspective in iOS XE, there are a couple of different ways, a couple of commands we have to do depending on the level of accounting we want. Right? When I first started doing this, I would just kind of hit this first one. Accounting exec, default, start, stop, group, ice, tack, X. What that command does is anytime somebody enters into an enable mode, an exec mode on my device, it will send an accounting message to ICE and say, hey, this person just entered and logged in. And then when, I, when that session ends, it sends a stop message, which is handy to know. Like, when did somebody log in? How long were they connected? What that doesn't do on its own, though, is actually send the accounting messages for when commands are ran. That's what these other commands do. Accounting commands 15 and accounting commands 1, this is how I actually send off to my accounting server when Hank or a user types a command in. You can do them separately. If you really only care when somebody uses like a, a high-level command, a Priv15 command, you can just do that accounting message. 
If you also want to know when people run the other types of commands, things that are available to like a basic operator user, well, then you can do your accounting commands one, right? And send those off as well. Make sure you hit them both. On Nexus, things get grouped together, slightly simpler on this side. Our authentication and authorization commands are very, very similar. In fact, they're, I think they might be darn near exactly the same. And then with accounting, it's kind of just the single accounting. We want to send these commands off as they go through. A couple of tips. These tips have been hard earned in my years as a network engineer. Thoroughly test your AAA configurations in a lab before pushing them out to production, particularly if production is on another continent. Right? We don't want to be sending RBAC commands that have been untested out to a live system. Take the time to test in a lab. Also, when you're testing in a lab, take the time to shut your authentication server off and make sure you can still get in with your local fallback. Really important step. Don't skip that one. Also, have a plan for when you lock yourself out of a device. I have yet to not lock myself out of a device at least once every time setting up a new system like this. That plan could be something like the, the, the super fun process where you do the reload in command, right? I've used that before. I've also used the plan where I just make sure our on-site data center engineer happens to be around should something go poorly, right? But have a plan for when you lock yourself out. And also, I've listed it as the option, but like I said, it's a really strong suggestion to keep console as local until you're confident in your configuration. Now, some people will keep the console or as local always. I like to eventually tie it back into RBAC um, once I'm sure everything is in good shape. Now that our devices are configured, let's talk about the steps to set up the authentication server. In this case, ICE. Here's the high level order we have to do. We need to connect into Active Directory, and then we have to select all of the external groups that we're going to use to define our roles. We then add all of our network devices into the inventory and include attributes that allow us to group them appropriately for different types of policies, right? What platform is it? What part of the network is it in? All of those are gonna be important when you're setting up your policies. Then we can go ahead and set the policy elements up. We need to know how, to, how do we identify proper users and devices. We're going to need to differentiate between our iOS devices and our Nexus devices. Build conditions to group those. Create your role profiles. So once we know what's, who somebody is, what do we have to tell the device they're allowed to do? And then finally, everything gets pulled together in a policy set. The policy set takes the user plus a device and determines what role do they get. Looking through this in screenshot style, inside of ICE, wow, that's, it's a little blurry, but inside of ICE, you can hit the Add button to join your ICE server to Active Directory. You can even see in my screenshot, maybe, that ICE supports joining multiple Active Directory systems. Super handy for large organizations that maybe have more than one server, or if you're migrating from one domain to another. Once you've joined the domain, then you can go ahead and add groups. Um, Wow, that is really blurry. Once you hit the Add button, there's a, there's a button in here to select groups from Active Directory. Then you can go ahead and just kind of browse and pick the groups you want. I recommend just pick the ones that are relevant. Most Active Directories are gonna have so many groups that tie into other systems or network access. Just pick the ones that are relevant for you. Next up, we'll go ahead and add our device uh, devices into ICE itself. There are two options for that. Well, there's more than two, but two we'll talk about. You can add them one at a time with the Add button, but my favorite way to do it is with the Import button. Create a little spreadsheet that has like the IP addresses, the pre-shared keys, anything necessary to import, and then you can do that kind of in a bulk stage. ICE even has an option to kind of export a, a kind of an example template so you know how to set up your spreadsheet. Makes it really easy to get that done. I also recommend don't... Um, don't fall victim to the easy way out, where on the IP address for a device, you don't have to put a single IP. You could put an entire network. You could put your entire management network in there and then treat every device as if they're all one. That's easy, but boy, does it make your granularity really tough. And so go the full distance, right? Identify each device uniquely. When devices go in, there's a lot of characteristics that we can add into them. Some of them are required, but ICE allows you to customize and add custom ones that are relevant for your policies. You'll need to specify a location, 
and our setup, our location indicates the rack that it's in, in, the, in there, what the device type is, and then you can create things like roles, out of band management switch. All of these are really helpful if your RBAC policies kind of differentiate based on some of these. If you've got certain users that are allowed to log into your management infrastructure, but not your actual data center fabric or some other portion, you need a way to differentiate from that. And we do that based on these characteristics that are in place. Once the users, the groups, the devices are in there, then we can go ahead and start to create our conditions that allow us to group things together. Within ICE, I can create conditions. Is it, it's really blurry for me. Is it easier to read back there? No, all right. So take my word for it that this picture shows I've created a condition that identifies my network administrators based on the Active Directory group. Now I've created a condition that's reusable in my policies. And if I have new groups that get added in as potentials to identify a role, I only have to change it in one place. Similarly, on the device side, I create a condition that I think says iOS XE devices. And then all of my different iOS XE platform numbers get grouped together. And so again, when I add and we upgrade from one version of Switch or we add a new version of a Switch into the environment, I don't have to update every single rule. I just update the condition. Makes it much, much simpler to reuse them. The policy elements, the role profiles, are how we actually define the rights that get assigned to a user. And you will need to create several profiles, most likely. Every device platform, iOS XE, Nexus, UCS, F5 load balancers, like every platform is going to need its own set of profiles because the way we instruct the, the platform what role they get will differ based on the platform type. You'll also need a unique profile for every role you have. And so in my example here, if I have iOS and Nexus devices, and then I have admins and operators, I'm going to need four different profiles. I'll need iOS admins, iOS operators, Nexus admins, Nexus operators. And then it kind of increases from there. Creating an iOS XE profile is, uh, this one's easier to see. Um, within ICE, there is what's referred to as these kind of common task types. So shell refers to kind of a basic iOS device. And these are convenience features inside of ICE to make it easier to identify the permissions based on the platform. So within Shell, I can just pick the privilege level. Privilege level is how iOS devices locally define the different roles. So Priv15, admin, Priv1, operator. When I switch over to Nexus, right, I can pick common task Nexus, and then I can pick the roles, right? Network administrator, network operator. When you're setting up your role profiles, I always recommend flip over to the raw view. The raw view shows you the actual attribute value pair that is sent to the device. Why this is important is if you're using a device that maybe isn't one of the common tasks, your documentation is gonna tell you exactly what this is supposed to look like. And so that's how you can QA it to make sure you're correct. Coming to the end, pulling things together, we get into our command policy sets. The policy sets, right? Oh, no, sorry, command sets. Um, I'm not going in, into deep on this, but we do have the ability to kind of add an additional layer into our roles that identify which commands a particular role is allowed to do. It's a little more complex of a setup, and it's not too often we need to do that, but know that that is possible. Now we get to policy sets. Policy sets are how we actually bring all of the AAA requests for authentication and authorization together and process them. Like many things in security, it's treated like an ACL. It's processed top to bottom, looking for a match. Once it finds a match, we assemble the policy set kind of through the different phases that are in there. The first step is what types of devices do we match? In this case, I've got that iOS XE condition that I created. For this one, any iOS XE device request comes in, will match this policy set. And then authentication and authorization are handled separately. In authentication, we identify what identity store are we going to check against. Here, I'm checking against Active Directory. And then down below, I use the groups and then the roles that I assigned as, as role elements to match them together. The authorization is also like an ACL. So put your kind of, you have to put your most specific at the top and then work your way down to typically a default deny access. 
And so if we authenticate somebody, but they don't match any of the roles, they just get a deny. Coming to the end, I know you're all itching to go to your next session. So let's see this a little bit in action. So our first two A's, I try to SSH into my device. Inside of ICE, I can look at the logs and I can see that there was an authentication and then an authorization attempt that happened. Remember, they're two separate steps, even if it feels like it's one to a user. Check out the detail view when you're doing your troubleshooting. There's a lot in the detail view, but the specific things to look for is, did it pass and what response was sent back to the device? Similarly on authorization, did it pass? What roles were sent back to the device? What were the specific values that get sent out? Our final A on accounting, you have to go into the accounting reports. And there are two of them that are valid. There's that start stop exec report where you'll see the log in and the log out. They each get stamped in the, the log. And then if you have turned on command authorization, you'll see them in the command authorization report as well. If you're trying to troubleshoot on the devices themselves, just a couple of commands that I find useful. Show TACX will give you the output for each of your TACX servers and whether they're functioning and healthy. And then you've also got the show AAA user all will actually show you details about the users that have logged in. My favorite part of this is the switch even knows the IP address that the person came from. Like we've got this connection information that gets passed through. So TACX authorization and rollback, very critical piece to go through. But if you break it down into its components, it's not that complicated. I'll say that complicated because yes, there's a lot that goes into it, but it is very important and it shows up on so many of our certifications. So a couple of final thoughts. We've talked about iOS and Nexus, but TACX and Radius can be used to authenticate all, a lot of different network and server and platforms from, um, from servers from Cisco to all sorts of other devices, PDUs, lots of things that are out there can be leveraged. It's also much, much easier to set up AAA on a device or in a system before you start putting it into production. So don't put that off until, ah, hey, we'll get to it eventually. And even if everybody on your team is an admin, make sure you set up RBAC and AAA because it's still important to know whether Hank made that change that broke the network or whether Bobby made the change that broke the network, right? It's important not to blame, but so that we can figure out what the heck happened, right? Knowing what happened is important. All right, with that, we've come to the end. Thank you all for joining me for this discussion of RBAC and AAA. If you have more questions on this or anything else, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information is up there. And I try to blog about all sorts of interesting technical things up on Cisco's blog. So feel free to follow me there as well. And with that, thank you all so much for joining me. Come back to the Cisco Youth Theater for more content all day today and tomorrow. Thanks, everybody.